Father in heaven, we ask now that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your most holy word, that you would help us to hear you, that you would stir in our hearts, in our minds, a deeper sense of affection for you, that you would break down the barriers that we place, and that we would find our greatest joy and our most full expression of life. In you. We pray now for the sake of your son Jesus. Amen. I'm sure that most of us have heard the short expression to jump ship. To jump ship is a word picture, it's a word picture that we use to describe when we are leaving something that is failing. The picture, of course, is an image of an ocean liner that has some sort of catastrophic damage and is beginning to sink to the ocean floor. And for the people who are on the ship, they have a choice to make. Do we stay in the boat and end up on the ocean floor ourselves, or do we jump ship? Well, we jump ship because it's better to be in the unknown. It's better to be in the waters, in the cold. It's better to try to find our way back to shore than to end up at the bottom of the ocean. And so we use that expression in a variety of ways in our life. You can use it in the term of a business. If you are a part of a business that is failing and is irreparably damaged, you might jump ship. If you're the franchise owner of a McDonald's restaurant and you hear that Chick-fil-A is going to be building right across the street, it's probably time to jump ship. We use that expression in our relationships. Imagine with me, uh, for those of you who are married, that moment when you are six months into your marriage, that you are deeply in love with this person that the Lord has brought into your life. You've spent your whole first couple years of your dating and your engagement in such a fashion that uh, he or she is seemingly your everything. (laughs) And now, six months into your marriage, you have your first real significant disagreement. Not the disagreement of whether you squeeze the top of the toothpaste tube or the bottom or the toilet paper rolls off the top of the roll or off the bottom. I'm talking about a real heavy disagreement, one where the voices are raised, (laughs) where tears are being shed, where it doesn't feel like you're on the same team. It feels like you're enemies. And as you part ways to provide some space to think and to process, and you're not sure if you're going to be sleeping in the same bed tonight. <laughs> you think to yourself in that quiet moment, I wonder if this is it. <laughs> I wonder if they're going to jump ship. You can use that expression in any form of commitment, any type of relationship, any type of business arrangement. And we see this expressed with the followers of Jesus in John chapter 6. If you've been with us for any amount of time, you've know that we are in the fourth message in the sixth chapter of John. And in this chapter, we've seen Jesus do some incredible things. He's, he's multiplied food and fed 5,000 people and women and children. He's walked on the water privately so that his disciples could re- renew their trust in him. And now he's been engaged in this very long back and forth dialogue with the religious leaders of the day. And now he's even teaching in the synagogue about the fact that he didn't just come to give bread, but that he came to be bread. That he didn't just come to do good things, but that he came to give life. And that as he's the one who gives life, he has these even difficult expressions along the way of what that life actually means for them. And we see as a result of all of these great things and all of this teaching... At the end of it all, almost everybody leaves. Nearly everybody jumps ship. And that's where we pick it up in John chapter 6, verse 60. So please follow with me as we read together. It says, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? 
then what if you what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who still do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said to them, this is why I told you that no one can come to the Father or come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Upon seeing what Jesus would do, feeding 5,000 people, and upon hearing what Jesus said about being the bread of life, and those who believe in him would have eternal life, and only those who the Father draws to him will come to believe, nearly all of them left. This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it, they said. And to say it that way, or to express it that way, is to say, Jesus, what you're saying can't be true. I refuse to accept it. And so we must remind ourselves briefly what he was saying to them and why it's so hard. (laughs) I can think of at least three reasons. There's more, but at least three. First of all, we see that these people, when you back out and take a step at, look at the whole chapter, we see that the people that are following Jesus wanted more bread (laughs) that Jesus would not give to them. He was multiplying food in their very midst. They were following him because they had their fill. They asked him to perform miracles like Moses, who in their estimation sent manna down from heaven And Jesus would not give them more physical bread because the whole point of the miracle was not to give bread, but to be bread. There's another reason why they're upset, and that is because Jesus offended them intentionally. You might remember the words of verse 53. We talked about it last week. Look at it with me now if you have your Bibles open. Jesus is describing to them what it means to believe, and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Jesus is not talking about some sort of mystical cannibalism here. He's using a very vivid metaphor to describe what belief actually looks like. Belief has some very similar characteristics to eating and drinking. And if you're going to believe in him, the equivalent of that would be eating and drinking of his flesh and of his blood. Now, some of the Jews sitting in the synagogue had a very hard time hearing that. Because for a Jew, they would not eat meat with any blood in it. No medium rare steaks for the Jews. Well done all the way through because to consume blood was to be unclean. And so for Jesus to say to them, to eat my flesh... And to drink my blood was extremely offensive. And number three, and I think perhaps most importantly, this was a hard saying for them because they were unwilling to give up their own sovereignty in religious beliefs. And because they were unwilling to give up their own sovereignty, They were unable to take the first steps of faith. They wanted control. But God was in control. And he was in control even over their own salvation. 
And so you see, this is a hard saying. (laughs) Jesus is God's chosen giver of life, and God draws people to him that they might believe and therefore live. This is a hard saying, Jesus. Jesus, you can say a lot of things, you can do a lot of things, but you can't say that we aren't in control. You can't say that you're the only purveyor of life. You can't put that level of exclusivity on your own person and your own words. And they prepared to leave. And I love Jesus' response. He reminds them, again, of who they're leaving. Look at verse 61 and verse 62. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if, you, what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? The second half of Jesus' thought there is implied. It's a, it's a rhetorical question. It sounds something like this. You're offended at this? But what if you saw the Son of Man going back up to heaven from where he came? <laughs> Would you still be offended then? Would you still want to have control? He grounds his authority in his divine nature. Jesus was the one who came down to earth and he would be going back up to heaven. Jesus was the one who condescended to man and would be lifted up on a cross. Jesus was the one who was made lowly among them. But there would be a time when he would reign again from the throne room of all eternity. And they left. And they left. And so you pause for a moment and you consider a few realities of what's happening here. The first one is that God is revealing himself. Jesus, as the Son of God, is revealing himself to be God. And any time there is God revealing himself, there is often the threat and often the case of conviction or offense. That's why it needs to be revealed to us instead of us just figuring it out or being able to perceive it by ourselves. We are unable in and of ourselves to see God truly and fully. We can't do it. And so we have to rely on what God reveals to us about himself. And in doing so, there are going to be times when we don't like the implications, where it grates against our own perception or our own desires. And it becomes clear that with Jesus that there's not a middle ground here. I mean, at first, it might seem that there's a middle ground, and we know that Jesus is very gracious, and he has a long on-ramp for people to consider and to think, and a long on-ramp toward the journey of faith. But, but at its core, in the total sum, Jesus is loving and kind and providing and self-sacrificial, and he doesn't appear to demand too much of me. He only demands that I believe in him. But when you listen to his words very carefully, you see that there's not a lot of room to hedge your bets here. You're either all in or all out at the end. You can't corner him or box him in, and you you certainly can't figure him out or make him conform to your ideal of how the world should function. Now, you can apply that both generally and specifically for what it means for us. I mean, generally we ask, well, how do we respond to Jesus? How do I respond to Jesus in the little things or the big things that I don't like? (laughs) We have little turning points all the time. Times when we might say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? About relationships, about how we use our money, about gossip, about sexuality, or about anything in which the revelation of Jesus grates on our fleshly or natural desires. And when we are at those turning points, we must ask the question, am I going to follow him 
because he is the son of God who came from heaven, (laughs) or am I going to go my own way? And specifically applied, you can see that true faith here is displayed in those who follow him, even in the midst of hard truth. And this hard truth is that he is the only son of God. That one must believe in him and him alone to be forgiven. That unless people eat and drink of him, they won't have life. And those who continue to follow his words will be shown to be his true disciples. And that will be revealed at these types of turning points. 4,988 people just left Jesus. If he was the pastor of a church, he'd be fired. Think about the ups and downs just in, just in these 70 verses. Just a few days ago, he comes on the scene. So many people immediately press in on him. He does this incredible miracle. The word spreads throughout the surrounding communities. The life givers here, he's given away free bread. So much so that he needs to withdraw just to have time with his father and with his disciples. They retreat across the lake. The disciples ride. Jesus walks. And all the people get in the boats. They follow him across the lake themselves and to press in on him again. Thousands were following him. Thousands were calling themselves disciples. And now, nearly all of them jump ship. It's better to be into the unknown or to what we think we know than to follow this guy, they say. And the following of Jesus has now become a resistance to Jesus. This is the turning point. And it looks like that the resistance is winning. And so we ask the question, who is winning here? Is God winning or Satan? All these people and only 12 remain and yet one of them, even those 12, is called a devil. Who's winning? Is Jesus accomplishing anything? Is he accomplishing his purpose? John 6 says, the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. And you have to ask yourself the question, why does he display the lowest of the lows here? What's the whole point of saying all these people have left? And Jesus' particular words in response to them leaving. I think there's a few reasons. The first is to just display plainly that There will be some who give superficial professions of faith, but they won't be genuine in their nature. There's a difference between a follower or a disciple and a true believer or a true disciple. A disciple, the language, the term disciple just means follower or learner of Jesus, right? But here you see there are plenty of, quote, disciples, and they end up leaving. And then there remain some true disciples or true believers, And this has been this way from the very beginning. It's that way right now as well. There will be plenty who have an affinity to Jesus in some way. Maybe they grew up in a church home. Maybe they come to church right now. Maybe they love the idea of him. But they will not ultimately trust him, surrender to him, or have true faith in him. They might walk an aisle. They might come to church. They might give to the needy. But they will not ultimately follow his teachings and trust him as the life giver. Soren Kierkegaard once wrote along these lines. He said, if you have any knowledge of the human nature, then you know that those who only admire the truth, when danger appears, will become traitors. (laughs) An admirer is infatuated with the false security of greatness. But if there is any inconvenience or trouble, the admirer pulls back. Admiring truth instead of following it is just as dubious as the fire, as the fire of erotic love, which at the turn of a hand can, cha- can be changed into exactly the opposite, into hate, into jealousy, into revenge. Christ, however, never asks for admirers. He never asks for worshipers or adherents. He consistently spoke of followers, and we might say true 
disciples. And so despite what's happening, we also see here that Jesus knows the hearts of the people who are there, and he's not surprised by any of it. He's not surprised that maybe 5,000 people walked away. Nor will he be surprised at the betrayal of Judas. Look at verse 63 with me. Jesus says it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe. And who it was who would betray him. And so looking down at verse 70, Jesus again for the second time refers to Judas. Verse 70, Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. And he spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. And so Jesus mentions all of these people leaving. It says that he knew that this was going to happen. He wasn't surprised in any way, shape, or form that they didn't believe. He saw their hearts. He understood. And then there's this bizarre mention of Judas, who didn't even leave yet. Why is he in the middle of all this? Well, it's to illustrate a point. It's to illustrate the point that no matter what it looks like is going on on the outside, whether departing or following, that God is sovereign over salvation. He will not be surprised. He will not be startled. (laughs) Verse 44 of chapter 6, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And that's great news for you. (laughs) It's great news for you that God draws sinners to the Son unto salvation. And it's great news for you if you're a Christian that you can look through your life and you can see instances where it seems like there is great mounting or growing resistance to Jesus, but at the very same time you can have confidence no matter what it looks like out here, God hasn't lost. (laughs) He's not surprised. He's not fearful that somehow... He'll be rejected. Some of us would say something like, we look at the political state of our country and the social status of our country and say, wow, we used to have a Christian country and now what? look at what's happened here. I mean, we abort babies at full term. Seems like we're always at war. Seems like in our culture right now, we're redefining gender in the very face of biology. We have disputes about lawlessness and immigration and we even separate children from their parents at the borders. We celebrate sin in our culture, in our country in a variety of ways. What looked like it was going in the right direction 50 years ago is going in the wrong direction today. Maybe Jesus is lost. One time he had a grip on our country and now it's gone. Or Maybe we'll say, I keep sharing my faith, but it doesn't seem to be doing any good. I've been witnessing to people about Jesus for 10 years, and only one or two have put their faith in him. Maybe Jesus is lost. Or some of us might say, I keep holding fast to the Lord, but my life just keeps getting harder and harder. More difficult and more difficult. And God promises these blessings and I don't know if I'm seeing them or experiencing them. Maybe it's time to jump ship. Maybe Jesus has lost. But what we see in John 6 is that despite the outward appearances, he hasn't lost. (laughs) This is great news. He's not surprised. God is sovereign over his plan. He's sovereign over salvation. He's sovereign over souls. He's sovereign over the entire world. Jesus is God's chosen life giver, and God draws people to him so that they would believe and so that they would have life. 
He hasn't lost, regardless of what it looks like. And so the question that Jesus then turns to with his disciples, these 12 that he's chosen, Jesus asks them, do you want to go away as well? 4,988 people, give or take a couple, have all left. Are you going with them? And Peter gives this beautiful response. He says in verse 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? (laughs) You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and we've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. To whom shall we go? That's the question. And that question, I think, implies that Peter has probably thought about going to somebody else. This ship looks like it's sinking. (laughs) So where will you turn? Where will you turn to find life? Will you turn to your own self-understanding and to your self-discovery? We all, as people, go through seasons of life where we grow and we learn and we understand things differently and we discover things. We see the world through different lenses, through textured layers. You think of different marker points maybe in your own life. The common ones for people are puberty. (laughs) You see the world differently after puberty than you did before. (laughs) You have all these hormones and emotions and things that you didn't have before. Or leaving your parents' home for college or for your first job. When you live in that context, the world seems and feels black and white in some ways, but you go out and live as a young adult on your own, now there's all kinds of shades of gray, new textures that you're envisioning the world through, and you're going through some self-discovery. Or maybe a midlife crisis. Some of you have gone through a typical midlife crisis. You're 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, and now you know what you want. (laughs) It took you 50 years to get there to see the world under this textured lens and you say, this is what I really like and this is what I really don't like and now I have some level of resources to do it. And so I bought a Corvette, convertible, red. That hit a little too close to home for somebody in the first service, I think. (laughs) Where will you turn? Will you turn to the cultural voices around us? To say, hey, if I want to be up with the times, i got to be in step with what's going on around here. Our culture is evolving fast. And the technological advancements are incredible. And the social advancements that we have are significant. But then you think about that for a minute and you say, wow, the cultural voices around me change with the news cycles. Global warming today, veganism tomorrow, transgenderism the next day, pro-politician This politician, anti-politician, that politician, pro this style or fashion this month, but next month it's going to be something different. It's an ever-changing cycle. And it's never ending in its change. And so you say, surely I don't think I want to put my hope onto that for the most significant things as it relates to my soul and to life and to eternity. And so where will you turn? Maybe to a particular philosopher. There's a lot of philosophers out there through the years that have been very helpful, some less helpful. Some turn to Darwinism or naturalism or postmodernism or nihilism, which is a sense saying, I'm not going to turn anywhere because it's all hopeless anyway. Or maybe you heard of a new philosophy that I learned about just this last week called antinatalism. Did you hear about that? A 27-year-old Indian man went viral this week after he announced his intention to sue his parents, claiming that he didn't give his explicit consent to bring him into the world. His name is Raphael Samuel. That's a clip of his YouTube video. It's a fake beard, by the way. And he said in the YouTube video, on just this last Tuesday, that he's suing his parents because he was conceived without his consent, and therefore his parents should pay for his life. He said, a quote, I want everyone in India and the world to realize one thing, that they were born without their consent. And I want them to understand that they do not owe their parents anything, he said. 
If we were born without our consent, then we should be maintained for our life. We should be paid by our parents to live. To children, I would like to say, do not do anything for your parents if you don't want to do it. If you want to, if you truly and genuinely feel like doing it, then doing it, he added. Samuel has been reportedly a follower of antinatalism, which is increasingly popular, yet bizarre ideology that believes it's morally wrong for people to procreate because it takes a nihilistic approach to the world that believes that human life only brings suffering and therefore isn't good inherently. Surely you're not going to turn to philosophy to give you life. How about a loved one? Many of us do that. And for as meaningful as life-giving as our relationships with our loved ones are, we still sin against each other. We still hurt each other. And maybe most importantly, all of our loved ones will die. (laughs) Some of them before us. Some of them after us. But surely we can't root our hope of our soul in one who will die and stay dead. But you can in one who will die and not stay dead. And so Jesus is looking at his disciples and Simon Peter says to him, Lord, whom shall we go? Thought about that one and that one and that one and that one. You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And I love the nature of this genuine response. It's got sort of three parts to it. It's got an expression of need or desperation. Whom shall we go? There's no one to go to but you. It's got recognition in it. It's got a sort of a mental or cognitive recognition that you are the one who has these life-giving words to us, and it's got faith. We have believed and come to know that you're the Holy One, the Son of God. We've believed that you are the one who was in heaven and came down and will be going back to heaven. We have believed that you can do things that nobody else can do. That We have believed and we've come to know that you are the one who's been prophesied about as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world. We have believed that there's nobody else that we can trust our life, our soul, our destiny, our eternity, our forgiveness in. Nobody but you. And so they stay. And Jesus gives life to those who believe. I don't know where you've been turning to at these turning points in your life or where you're tempted to turn. I, I imagine that some of us have been tempted to jump, jump ship <laughs> at the hard teachings of Jesus. Others of us are just worn down by the difficulty of this world. And some of us are coming to Jesus still with conditions. That's what's happening here in John 6. They're coming to Jesus, but they have certain conditions. And when the conditions aren't met, they leave. And all of us struggle with that. All of us come to Jesus with a level of condition. And even as those who have put faith in him were tempted to reinsert those conditions again upon him, Tim Keller says it this way. He says, I've heard people say I'm checking out Christianity. But I understand Christians can't do this, and the Bible says that we're not supposed to do that, that you're supposed to love the poor, that you're supposed to give up sex outside of marriage. I can't accept that. And so people want to come to Christ with all kinds of conditions. But the real question is this. Is there a God who is the source of all beauty and glory and life. And if knowing Christ will fill your life with his goodness and power and joy so that you would live with him in endless ages and his life is increasing in you every single day, if that's true, we wouldn't say things like, you mean I have to give up getting drunk? 
I have to give up sex outside of marriage or whatever it might be for you. Let's say for a moment that a friend is dying of a terrible disease and you take him or her to the doctor and the doctor says, ah, great news, I have a remedy for you. If you just follow my advice, you'll be healed and you'll live a long and fruitful life. But there's only one problem. You can't eat chocolate anymore. Now what if your friend turned to you and said, well, forget it. <laughs> life without chocolate is no life at all. <laughs> I'm going to follow the doctor's prescription for a remedy, but, but I'm going to continue to eat chocolate at the same time. You would say that person is off the rocker. If Christ is really God, then all the conditions are gone. If true and lasting life is really before you, if it's really offered to you, then all the conditions are gone. You will do whatever he says. You will follow in whatever he wants you to do. You will say, Lord, anywhere your will touches my life, anywhere your word speaks, I will say, Lord, I will obey. There are no conditions anymore. If he's really God, he can't just be a supplement. We really have to come to him and say, Lord, I'm willing to let you start reordering my life completely. And that's what it looks like to have new life because you believe in him. And so let's pray together. For those of you here today who are Christians and have been for some time, we thank God. For those of you who are on the fence, it is my prayer that today you will ask yourself the question, where else am I going to turn if I don't turn to him? And what else will they give me? Because he is the only one who has the words of eternal life. Please pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the hard teachings of Jesus and for the real truth that he is indeed the son of the living God who's come from heaven. He did not stay dead that we can put our trust in him. And that when compared to the other places or people that we could turn to, that there is no comparison. Help us to know and to feel in our hearts. Draw more to yourself, we pray, even in this moment, that we may believe and have life for our good and for your glory.